Is using a real-time operating system in your project the right decision? Why would you want to use one? When I was an engineer back at General Dynamics in the late 80s, I ran a special project that moved our software architecture from a purely single-threaded approach in a language called Jovial to a new approach using object-oriented development in a new government-mandated language, which was called ADA. And we incorporated a real-time operating system rather than a cyclic executive. While reviewing this approach with an Air Force colonel at the time, the colonel asked me to explain what multitasking actually meant. I came up with what I think is a pretty good analogy to explain the concept. In this video, we'll check out this analogy and then jump into the code using our particle argon and use some of these concepts to update our display code, a new status indicator, and publishing our data up to the cloud. Okay, so this is the analogy that I came up with when this Air Force colonel back in the late 80s asked me just on the fly, what do you mean by multitasking? Multi-threading, what do you mean? I don't understand that concept. And so I invented this sort of on the fly and I actually think it holds up pretty well. So the analogy with threading is starting out by looking at streets in the city. So what I've done is I've got the Mart here, here's the Windy City Lab and the Mart, and we've got a couple streets here, here's Wacker, here's the river, uh, here's Kinsey, and then Fairbanks is going this way, Wells goes south, and I have this car wash over here that I've sort of fictitiously created. So the first part of the analogy that you need to understand is that the streets in the city are analogous to your code. So just as your code sits and says, okay, I'm gonna add and subtract some things, I'm gonna call this procedure, I'm gonna do this, and then I'm gonna do that, that's what these streets are. So, you know, this car needs to get out to the suburbs, it needs to go up Fairbanks, get on the highway and head out. Those streets are giving the instructions on how to do that, okay? So this, these little guys are actually cars. And so these cars move along on the streets. And if I really only have, and I think about only having one car on the road, and this car moves along on the road, then it is basically the act of moving the car is the CPU. And so what I've done is sort of uh, created a little bit of an abstraction above that and say that this is actually an electric car. And the electric car is only gonna run if it has a battery in it to power it. So once that battery is there, this car can move and it can head down the road and uh, move forward, basically execute the code. So um, what happens if we have multiple cars on the road? So if we end up having multiple cars, then we have to have a way of taking the single battery that we have and moving it between the cars. So think about the battery as like a uh, single core microcontroller. It only has one core, that means I only have one battery. If I had a multi-core, a two-core or four-core microcontroller, I would have four batteries. And that would mean that if I had four, I could actually put four batteries in four cars and they could all run at the same time. In this example, I'm just using a single core example. And so now I have to decide who gets the battery. That's the real-time operating system's job. That's me. So in the analogy, I am the real-time operating system. So I can go over here and say, okay, you're next. And so this guy gets some time and goes along, and then I say, okay, you, you have enough time, and so I'm gonna remove the CPU from you, the battery, and I'm gonna put it into this car here because this car is the one that's been waiting the longest. This one had time, this one had time, now this one has time, and so it moves along as well. Now, the other thing that's interesting is um, these intersections we can think of as critical sections of code. And the reason for that, a critical section of code is where the CPU gets into that code and it has to be the only one in the code uh, during that time. So think of a display, a serial port, something like that. If you have multiple CPUs or multiple threads all trying to work with it at the same time, you're just gonna get garbled data. It's just not gonna work. So it's like you get in, you go do the things you need to do, you get out, then somebody else goes in. Intersection is the perfect example of that. So if I have a car here and I have this car here, they both shouldn't enter the intersection at the same time. If they do, they're gonna crash. 
So what happens here is what's referred to as a mutex, which we'll see in the code when we jump in next. Um, and the mutex actually prevents this from uh, happening where both end up at the same time, okay? So this car here, we decide, okay, you got the mutex, you're in. This car is not gonna be able to enter the intersection. The other thing that's interesting is that while this is in there, even if I were to lose the CPU, if I were to lose the presence of the battery, so um, it's stuck now in the middle of the intersection, I'm not gonna give the battery to this guy because he can't move anyway. So since this thread can't uh, move forward, it's what's in a wait state, it's never gonna get the CPU until that clears which is cool because he's not gonna use any resources of the system while it's in that state. But I can go over here and I can give this power and let this car move along. Okay, so before we get started doing some multi-threading and using a real-time operating system, looking at mutexes and queues and so forth, I wanted to just sort of reset and show where we are on the project. So. Right now we have uh, a xenon that is getting a temperature reading from the MCP 9808. It's only getting onto the mesh network. It's not getting onto the particle cloud. Uh, and then over here we have an argon that is also part of the same mesh network and it's fired up. It's uh, also on the mesh network, again, not on the Wi-Fi, not on the particle cloud, but it is listening to a particular temperature measurement coming from the xenon and that's what's getting displayed here. And we can see if I just hit reset, um, what will happen is it will go out, uh, set to the external antennas, and it will then bring the mesh network up and running. And when it gets a reading from the uh, xenon, it will display it. And that number underneath that uh, temperature is the number of milliseconds since the last reading. So what I've got it set up to do is if this ends up going past 10 seconds, I wanna know that this number is old. So what I'm gonna do is just off camera here, I'm going to shut off the xenon, and we'll see that at 10 seconds, we end up getting a old indication on the display. So if we were to go look at this and see 25.3, we realize that that is at least 10 seconds old, it could be two years old for all we know, the way it's designed right now. And then of course, if I plug the xenon back in, and it fires up and it starts sending new data, we get a, a new number. So that was about 25 seconds since the last update, uh, but now it's at every six seconds, which is about right, and uh, we don't have an old indication anymore. So with that, let's jump in and look at the code that at least is doing that so that we've got a baseline to go from there. So a couple really important things right here at the beginning is system mode manual and system thread enabled. And again, remember, system mode manual says that we're gonna control all the radios and make sure that, and do everything ourselves rather than letting the system do it. And it also means that we won't be held up while it tries to do it before setup is called. And then the second thing is system thread enabled. And what this does is the, the system thread is essentially the device OS managing all of the network connectivity. And that all can now happen on a separate thread. And threads, uh, again, if you watch the analogy that I just did, um, it is basically like these cars driving through the streets of a city, and every car is a thread. And so what we've got is really two cars now. So we've got the system thread, which is managed by um, Particle, which is actually doing all the network connections, and then we have our own thread, which actually runs setup and loop. So those are important for all of the stuff that we do going forward. So these should just, in my view, sort of be a given for what you're gonna add. And then um, I have a, uh, when I've wired this up, which I've talked about before, D4 is our reset to the OLED, which is important. I've created a, a define for the time string size of being 10 bytes. Uh, and I've also said that data is old means that about 10 uh, microseconds, uh, that means that we will indicate an old status. I like to use pound defines rather than these numbers down in the code because the numbers down in the code just end up being what I call magic numbers. And if I change one, I have to change the other. Also by doing pound defines, we don't take up any additional memory. 
So if I define them potentially as constants or I define them in some other way, uh, they may end up taking some uh, both flash and RAM, depending on how you do it. In this way, I know for sure that uh, this is as though it's like a preprocessor. Basically, it's going to go through, find these pound defines, and replace them with the actual number before it actually does the compile. So we have a couple things here. We have a time of last update, um, which is an unsigned long, which is what Millie's returns. And our time string that we're displaying is going to be uh, a, an array of characters. And again, we've said that those are 10. I've also restructured the uh, function for displaying messages. So now what you can do is you can give it a text size, you can give it a line number, and you can give it the data, and it will do all of this for us. And uh, so that's cool. So we're not repeating that code every time we need to write to the display. So that keeps it kind of dry. And then here we have the show temp. So the show temp is actually the function that's called once we've done our subscription. And what it does is every time a message comes to that particular event that we've signed up for, then this is called. So we would end up uh, grabbing the milliseconds currently, the current time, and subtracting the last time we got an update. That's going to be our delta. And the delta is what we're going to display, as we see down here, um, for uh, putting it to the display. And then the data coming in is basically the formatted Celsius reading from the Xenon. So that's going to come in, get displayed as well. So these two uh, lines we've seen before, but I just want to briefly state it again. This is how we currently have to set the external antenna. And we're using the external antenna for our Bluetooth, which is also uh, an antenna is built into the Argon for Bluetooth. But I want to use the external one because in some future videos, I'm going to put these throughout a very large space here in the Mart. And we're going to do some range testing and so forth. And I want to use uh, the external antennas going forward. And then um, we just clear our display as we start up our setup. So we've got the external antenna enabled. And then we actually write out mesh dot 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 to our display. What that's doing is then indicating to us that we're about to start connecting to the mesh network. So we do a mesh.on, mesh.connect, and then we do this really uh, nice function that Particle has given us where you say wait until, and then you give it a function that is going to return a true or false. And as long as it returns false, um, we are not going to move forward. And once it does return true, we'll move on to the next line. And then finally, in our setup, we do a subscribe to this event new temp. And show temp is the actual function that gets called here whenever we get a new uh, reading. And then finally, here in loop, we again, every time we loop, we go and check uh, the current time minus the last time we got an update. And if that, de if that delta is greater than the, del the data is old number that we did, which was 10,000, then we go ahead and write to the display uh, old and we do it kind of over on the right-hand side. So that's the code as we start out. And what I want to do now is jump into adding our first independent thread in the system. OK, so to look at threading, um, what I want to do is sort of consider a hypothetical case where we have a new requirement, which is that we want to add an LED to our uh, argon and display uh, mechanism. And I want this LED, LED to go off for a period of one or two seconds whenever it receives a temperature from the xenon. And so we could do that in the code here by when we do a um, show temp, as an example, we could inside here not only send the message or set the uh, message over to the display, but we could also do a two second delay in here. But one of the things that I don't really care for in that uh, method is that I really don't know necessarily how fast I'm going to get temperature readings. And so given that, um, I don't know if I want to really be delaying for several seconds inside this um, method that's actually running every time I receive a message. In many ways, it looks just like an interrupt. And a really good practice to think about always when you're managing interrupts, and I have another video coming up on interrupt handling, 
is you want to do things as quickly as you can in the interrupt handler and push off other things that'll take more time off to other threads or other mechanisms that don't delay the interrupt handling itself. So in this scenario, let's look at how we would do that. We're gonna treat this like an interrupt handler and we're going to do it using threads. So the first thing I'm gonna do is wire up uh, the LED. And again, when I do this, you're gonna go, hey, uh, crazy Kevin, you are hooking up a LED um, essentially directly and not putting a resistor there. And you're right. And that's because I'm using these awesome SparkFun LEDs that have resistors already built in. So I just think they are the most awesome idea and they really save me a lot of time because I normally have to run off and find another resistor. And I also don't have any idea why D5 is high at this point, um, but we'll address that at another time. So what I've done is I've attached the LED and now we're gonna go in and actually uh, use this. So first thing I'm gonna do is pin mode uh, D5 as an output. And then I'm going to do a digital write D5 low. And let's uh, go ahead and rebuild this and run it and see if we can at least get that LED to turn off. So I'm gonna go up here and I'm going to put our, put us in DFU mode, and I'm gonna go ahead and build and flash locally. So we should start out with seeing mesh here, and we should see that LED go off. Good, we did. And we are now seeing readings. Cool, so we have our LED in and going. So the next thing we wanna do is look at creating a thread and a mutex where we can synchronize. So this thread is what's gonna run independently um, and set this LED whenever we get a message. So the way we can create a thread, uh, the first thing to do is, uh, I like to start with actually the function that is going to be called as part of the thread. And we'll call this message LED. And whenever we uh, do a, a function like this that's gonna be a thread, it's always going to return void and the, uh, it's always going to have an argument, which is a pointer to something, some data, which is void at this point, is void meaning that it's sort of undefined, can point to anything, um, and it also could be null. It, uh, we don't have to supply anything at all. And then what we're gonna do is, uh, if I say digital write um, D5 high, and then I'm gonna say delay 2000, and then I'm gonna say digital write D5 low. Then what would happen is when this runs, uh, it would set the pin high, it'll wait two seconds and then it'll set it low. Now, because this is going to be a thread, it needs something very critical, which is threads can never return. So a thread must start and then once it starts up, it's going to run forever. So the way we do that is just put it in a while loop, say while one, which is same as while true, and we'll put this inside there. And, whoop. And we now have a function that can become a thread. Now, once this runs, obviously it would just continue to run, uh, turning it high for two seconds, then turning it low and then back high again. So we're gonna need some synchronization here. But before we get into the synchronization, let's go ahead and declare the thread itself, get it set up, and then we'll move on to the synchronizing mutex. So the way we do that here is we say OS thread T, which is basically the thread type, and we'll call it thread, because I'm so uncreative at this point. And um, we've got it declared, and then now down in setup, we want to actually create the thread itself. And so the way we do that is we won't create this thread until we've actually got onto the mesh network and everything's running. So we would say OS thread create, and we can see that it has um, various set of parameters that should be passed, okay? 
So the first thing we want to do is it's, it's saying that it needs a pointer to OS thread T. So that's going to be a pointer to thread. Now it's saying that it wants a name. So this could be any name we want to give it. It's mainly for debugging purposes and, and getting back thread names. We're not going to use that, so I'm going to just say null. Now priority, it turns out that we can set the priority of the thread. And I did talk a little bit about priorities when I talked about the analogy. Uh, with the city and cars, so you can reference that. But in, suffice it to say that we want this thread to just be at the same priority as everything else. So it, it's going to be serviced in pretty much a round robin fashion. So we can just say OS thread priority default. And then uh, now it wants the function that we're actually going to call. So it's message LED. And then finally, um, it's looking at any parameters we want to pass. I'm going to put null there because we don't have any. And then I'm going to give it a stack size of 2048. So one of the things to think about is obviously every time you create a thread, it has to have its own stack because it swaps in and out. And a lot of what's in the stack uh, and the, P, you know, the PC counter and all of this stuff that it has to manage has to get swapped in and out between each thread. And depending how deep your calls are within it is going to affect how deep this stack needs to be. So we're not going very deep in this thread because all we're doing is calling digital write. And uh, so there will be some stack usage, but nowhere near 2K, I would imagine. And so at some point in the future, we can go through how you run your code and see kind of what that worst case number is. And then the goal is, is not to set it much higher than that um, so that you're not using RAM or allocating space um, for the thread that you don't need. So this will actually not only create the thread, but fire the thread off and start it, okay? So we're not gonna run this, but I do wanna just see if this compiles. Cool, it compiled successfully, so that's a great start. <clears throat> so now let's think about how we're going to coordinate this thread with the message. And the way we do that is using what's referred to as a mutex. Now, I would normally use a semaphore, um, and I typically try to use mutexes to be sort of protectors over critical sections of code. Um, and again, that's yet another topic. Um, it'd be like a shared resource, so I, only, I may have multiple threads in the system, but I only want one thread to be able to have access, let's say, to talking to the display at any point in time, and a mutex is a perfect way to do that. Um, th uh, semaphores, on the other hand, I think this is a perfect uh, way of coordinating the action of one thread to another and saying, okay, when, when this happens, then this should happen, and it can do that through a semaphore that starts just at a count of one, one or zero, um, so if the semaphore is one, somebody tries to get the semaphore, it works, they get it, and it goes to zero. They try to get it again, that's not gonna work until somebody signals it again. So unfortunately, we don't have access to semaphores yet. Um, they're down in the uh, HAL concurrent library, but they're not exposed in the header file for whatever reason. And so uh, we, can get away, we can get around that by just using mutex. So what we're gonna do is say OS mutex, uh, T, the type, and we'll just call it mutex. And then what we want to do is create this mutex. So we'll come down here and we'll say OS mutex create. And it just needs a pointer to the mutex name, which we would say mutex. Now, with this mutex created, um, then the thread, when it gets created, is, it's fine for it to go use the mutex or refer to it. So to synchronize this action, the first thing we want to do is see if we can get the mutex. And so we do that by saying OS mutex lock. And we refer to the mutex itself. So what that is doing is it's trying to lock the mutex, meaning that it wants to take control of it. And if that succeeds, if it can lock it, it can then move on to whatever code is below it. But if something already has the mutex, if somebody has already locked it, when you call this, then your thread is put in a waiting state and it will wait for that mutex to become free. 
And so it no longer uses resources of the system. The RTOS will put it in a waiting queue, and essentially that's where it will sit until this mutex frees up. So the state that we have right now is the assumption is, is that the mutex will be held onto, and then we'll release the mutex whenever we get a message. So here it locks it. Uh, if, it gets, if it succeeds in locking it, it will go through and, and it will do these three things. Now, obviously, if it loops right around again, it's still locked it, so it can't lock it again. So at that point, it will suspend itself. So it will go back into a waiting state. So the other side of the coin here is looking at the code to send the signal uh, and work with the mutex so that the mutex gets released uh, and things can move forward on the lock. So what happens here is we have show temp. This is the thing that runs, right, whenever we get a message. So what we want to do here is say uh, OS mutex unlock mutex. And so what happens here is if the mutex is already locked, which means that this thread cannot proceed, then when we get a message, we update the data on the display, and then we do an unlock. So when we do an unlock, what that does is unlocks this mutex, which allows it to then do the uh, LED for two seconds, and then it'll try to come back around. Of course, it's still locked, uh, and it will wait until another message is sent. So in theory, this should do what we need it to do. So let's give it a try. So I'm first going to do a quick compile here, see if everything compiles, and it does. So what we're going to do is go up here. We're going to put it in DFU mode, and I'm going to do a build and flash. So we have no LED at the moment. We now have a message. So we've got, whenever there's green, it's sending. And then notice the red is saying that we got a message. There's another message. And it's working. So essentially, we have a thread outside of the actual subscription to the message coming in that's setting the um, mutex and the thread. This other thread is actually managing the LED.